in the face of God. Now that was a beautiful song about how, how we are all are God, and yet we also are human. So is anyone here perfect by human standards? Just raise your hand, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, you won't be able to listen to this, right? Yeah, yeah, you can stay if you want, though. Feel free. Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone lived their life without without some kind of wounds or challenges? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. So none of us are perfect. Why not? It's because we are human as well as divine. We are absolutely human as well as divine. We live in this paradox. Of, of humanity and divinity that's all mixed up in us. Now in January we talked a lot about our back and basics and about how we are all this, this spiritual essence, how, about how it lives and moves and has its being in, through, and as us. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the human part. The human part that, maybe not for any of you, but that for some folks, it contains some imperfection, some imperfection. So looking at the cracks in the face of God, our humanity in the midst of our divinity requires that we are gentle with ourselves, requires that we practice forgiveness, and requires that we practice understanding for ourselves and others. Because we are this mix of human, and divine. The personal challenge for each of us is to live within this paradox, to take advantage of both of those things, to accept our humanness, and to still move into that place where we are always growing greater and greater in our understanding and expression of the divine essence that we are. So we're human and divine. Cracks in the face of God. So what might these cracks look like? Well, it might be feeling like we're not good enough. Feeling like we are just not up to snuff, that we're not meeting the, the expectations of ourselves and others. Or it could be fear. It could be some childhood wound. It could be an illness or anything that grabs our attention. Anything that throws us for a loop and causes or forces us to look at our life in a new and different ways. Some of these imperfections end up being gifts. Now you may have heard the story of the cracked pot. It's a story for anyone who's not quite perfect, which is certainly me. A water bearer in India had two large pots one hung on each end, end of a pole, and, and she wore the, the, um, the pole across her neck so she could carry the water. One of the pots had a crack in it, and while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full pot of water, the cracked pot leaked and didn't uh, always um, arrived with only <coughs> half, half a pot full of water. So. For a full two years, this went on every day. And because we know that pots that carry water have deep feelings, um, the, the pot that was cracked got, got depressed and embarrassed. And, and the perfect pot, of course, was proud of its accomplishments because it was doing what it had been made to do. And the cracked pot felt that it was definitely imperfect and less. So after a couple of years of bitter failure, the cracked pot talked to the water bearer and said, and said, I'm, I have to apologize to you. I am so embarrassed and, and so ashamed. And the water bearer said, well, what are you ashamed about? And, and the cracked pot said, well, you know, you, you do all this work and you only end up with a half a pot of water. Now, the water bearer, of course, was open-hearted, and she said, what I want you to do is on the way back, after we filled the pots, I want you to, to, to 
So look at the flowers. Look at the flowers along the path. And so the craft pot did, but it still, it still felt bad when it got back to the to the mistress's house. And so it said, I, you know, yeah, the flowers are great, but still, you know, I'm leaking. And and the water bearer says, Well, did you notice that the flowers were only on your side of the on your side of the path? That there weren't any flowers on the other side? She said, I honor you. I have known about your flaw. I have loved you for it. I have taken advantage of, of that. She said, I planted, I planted seeds on only your side of the path. And you have watered them each day. Because you have watered them each day, I have been able to come and pick flowers for my mistress's table. If you had not had a crack, her, her home would not have been filled with beauty for these two years with the beautiful, beautiful flowers. And the um, moral of the story, of course, is that we are all cracked pots. <laughs> yeah, we are all cracked pots. But the cracks and the flaws that we each have, don't they make life interesting? I mean, don't they make life absolutely fascinating and give us opportunities to accept ourselves and accept other people? Um, it's just an amazing thing. So there are gifts in our imperfections. Now, as some of you know, wait. Okay, there we go. As some of you know, um, I was born de completely deaf in one ear. And um, that, for so long, seemed like a horrible imperfection to me. I was in speech therapy for year after year after year. Other kids made fun of me. Even some family members made fun of the way I talked. And I didn't think it was a good thing at all. It was definitely, I considered it an imperfection. But what I have come to realize is that because of my lack of hearing on one side, I have learned to listen. I've learned to read lips and read faces and read eyes and read hearts. A gift that seemed like an imperfection is what has allowed me to be able to open up and listen to people in ways that I could never have with this ear. One of those imperfections, a crack in the face of God, that's been an incredible gift for me and other people. So what, what cracks in the face of God? What imperfections might there be lurking in you that are truly gifts, that truly serve you and the world? And in addition to our imperfections, many of us have wounds and challenges in life, broken hearts and broken dreams. There's a crack. Emerson observed that there is a crack in everything God has made. A crack in everything God has made. So perhaps that's where God enters through those cracks. Perhaps our wounds are an open invitation to healing. So this is quite a day for stories today, because David told a story, and I just told a story, and I'm going to tell another story. <laughs> um, there's uh, another story that I want to share with you, and this comes from Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, and she is uh, an amazing uh, physician who has done work in integrative medicine for years in hospice work and in doing just some absolutely great stuff. This is a story about anger. And... Um, she wrote, one of the angriest people I've ever worked with was a young man with osteogenic sarcoma of the right leg. He had been a high school and college athlete, and until the time of his diagnosis, life had been good. Beautiful women, fast cars, personal recognition. Two weeks after his diagnosis, they removed his right leg above the knee. This surgery, which saved his life, also ended his life as he had known it. Playing ball was a thing of the past. 
Now, in those days, there were many sorts of self-destructive um, behaviors available to someone like that, and he took advantage of them. He was an angry young man. He refused to turn to school, he, college. He began to drink, to use drugs, to alienate his former admirers and friends, and to have automobile accident after automobile accident. <coughs> and after one of those, one of his former coaches um, re recommended that he come and work with Dr. Renan. So he was a powerful though, and handsome young man, profoundly self-oriented and isolated. At the beginning, he had the sort of rage that felt very familiar to me, she says. Filled with a sense of injustice and self-pity, he hated all the well people. In our second meeting, hoping to encourage him to show his feelings about himself, I gave him a drawing pad and asked him to draw a picture of his body. He drew a crude sketch of a vase, just an outline. Running through the center of it, he drew a deep, Crack. He went over and over the crack with a black crayon, gritting his teeth and ripping the paper. He had tears in his eyes, tears of rage. It seemed to me that the drawing was a powerful statement of his pain and the finality of his loss. It was clear that the broken vase could never hold water, could never function as a vase again. It hurt to watch. After he left, she says, I folded the, pic the picture and saved it because it seemed too important to throw away. In time, his anger began to change in subtle ways. He began one session by handing me an item torn from our local newspaper. It was an article about a motorcycle accident in which a young man had lost his leg. His doctors were quoted at length. And Dr. Renan finished reading this and then looked up. Those idiots don't know a thing about it, he said furiously. Over the next month, he brought in more articles, some from the paper, some from a magazine. A girl who had been severely burned in a house fire. A boy who had, whose hand had been partly destroyed in a chemistry <coughs> set explosion. His reactions were always the same. A harsh judgment of the well-meaning people, well-meaning efforts of the doctors and parents. His anger, his anger about these other young people began to occupy more and more of his, of, of their session time. No one understood them, he said. No one was there for them. No one really knew how to help them. He was still enraged. It seems to me that underneath the anger, a concern for others was growing. Encouraged, I asked him if he wanted to do anything about it. Caught off guard, at first he said no. But just before he left, he asked me if I thought it, he could meet some of these others who suffered injuries like his. I said that I thought it was quite possible and that I would look into it. It turned out to be easy. Within a few weeks, he had begun to visit young people on the surgical wards whose problems were similar to his own. He came back from those visits full of stories, delighted to find that he could reach these young people. He was often able to help when no one else could. After a while, he felt able to speak to parents and families, helping them to better understand and to know what was needed. The surgeons, delighted with the results of these visits, referred more and more people to him. She goes on to say, my favorite of all his stories concerned a visit to a young woman who had a, a tragic family history. Breast cancer had claimed the lives of her mother, her sister, her cousin, and she had another sister who was in chemotherapy. And that last, that last event, her, her last sister needing to do chemotherapy for breast cancer made her um, move into action. And what she did was the, the treatment that was available at that time, she had both of her breasts completely removed surgically. 
So he visited her on a hot midsummer day, wearing shorts with his artificial leg in full view. But deeply depressed, she lay in bed with her eyes closed, refusing to look at him. He tried everything he knew to reach her, but without success. He said things that only another person with an altered body would dare to say. He made jokes. He even got angry. But she didn't respond. Now, all the while, while he was there, there was some um, music, some rock music, playing softly in the background. So frustrated, he finally stood up, and in a last effort to get her attention, he unstrapped the harness of his artificial leg and let it drop to the floor with a loud thump. Startled, she opened her eyes and saw him for the first time. Now, encouraged, he began to hop around the, the room on one foot <laughs> to snap his fingers and, um, and laugh and laugh and laugh. And finally, after about a minute, she started to laugh as well. She said, fella, if you can dance, I can sing. <laughs> the young woman became his friend and began to visit people in the hospital with him. She was still in school, and she encouraged him to go back to school, knowing that he could fulfill his dream better once he, once he had some training. Eventually, she became his wife. She was a very different sort of woman from the models and the cheerleaders that he had always dated before. Dr. Remen goes on to say, but before, but long before this, we ended our sessions together. In our final meeting, we were reviewing his journey. I opened his chart and found the picture of the broken vase that he had drawn two years before. I'm holding it. I asked him if he remembered draw the drawing he had made of his body. He took it in his hands and looked at it for some time. You know, he said, it's really not finished. Surprised, I extended my basket of crayons toward him, and taking a yellow crayon, he began to draw lines radiating from the crack in the vase to the very edge of the paper. Thick yellow lines. I watched, puzzled. He was smiling. Finally, he put his finger on the crack, looked at me, and said softly, this is where the light comes through. This is where the light comes through. Now, if you're like me, there are parts of you that are confident, and parts that are not so confident, parts that are accomplished, and, and parts that feel like you can't do all that you want to do. Those are the cracks in the face of God. The parts that let in the light. Those are the places where the light can shine through. So how can we bring more spiritual truth into these places, into these cracks in the face of God, into our challenges, into our wounds? We can do that by being gentle with ourselves and with others, because we're all in the same boat. We can avoid denial. If there's something we need to heal in our lives, we can just pay attention to it and face up to it because change can never happen unless we're willing to be honest with ourselves. And in those times when we feel broken, we can allow ourselves to feel our feelings. For in doing that, we can allow the, the feeling broken to, to change into being broken open having our hearts opened, having our minds opened. Author Vance Havner said it this way, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. 
And that being broken open, that allows a spaciousness. That allows places where the light can shine through, showing us all of our strengths and possibilities that we may not have even realized were there. And in that spaciousness, we can call on the divine. We can court the divine. We can ask for guidance and support and then let it in. Because I'm here to tell you, my friends, that even though there may be that crack of humanness, you are still the face of God. You are still the face of God. That is what supports that humanness. That is what you get to call on. That is what you get to shine for. I'm going to close with a quote from Ernest Holmes, our founder. In that inner sanctuary of our own nature, hidden perhaps from objective gaze, nestles the seed, perfection. You are an eternal being now on the pathway of endless unfoldment. Never less, but always more of yourself. Never less, but always more of yourself. And so as practitioners, stand with me. Let's move into prayer. Each face here, the face of God. Oh yes, there are cracks in the face. There, there is our humanness that we have come here to explore, that we have come here to enjoy, that we have come here to create from. And yet our basis is that we are one with the divine essence, the divine essence that is all of life, that says yes to whatever we choose. And so what I absolutely know is that as we each go forth, experimenting and noticing our humanness, we open to allow our divine self to come through in amazing ways that bless us and others, that heal us and others, where that is our absolute truth. And so knowing that spirit goes before each of us to make the crooked places easy, I simply let this go, let it be, and so it is. So now is the opportunity that we have to, 